Hello and welcome. My name is Tricia Edwards. I'm the Deputy Director of Smithsonian Affiliations, and I'm delighted to welcome you all this afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, Talking About Race with Children in Museums. We have nearly 300 people from the affiliate network and from across the Smithsonian with us today. We're pleased to be collaborating with the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture on this program, and we're so grateful to our colleagues for giving their time and expertise to introduce us to the museum's new Talking About Race portal and to help us all become more adept at having difficult conversations about race with our visitors, as well as in our communities and with our friends and families. Before, introduce, before I introduce our three presenters, um, just a few housekeeping items. We ask that everyone keep themselves on mute to avoid feedback and background noise. We also suggest turning your video off so that the focus stays on our speakers and that you use the speaker view rather than the gallery view. You can change that setting on the top right corner of your Zoom screen. Um, because we have such a large group with us today, we're, we'll manage the Q&A through the chat. So please put any um, questions and comments there and we'll be monitoring that. Um, and finally, the program is being recorded. Um, there's always, already been lots of questions in the chat about whether we would be doing so and we will send a link to the recording to everyone who registered for the program. Um, now I'd like to introduce our speakers from the National Museum of African American History and Culture and turn the program over to them. Leading us today are Anna Ferguson Henley, the Director of Early Childhood Education, Ariel Gorey, the Lead Education Specialist for or Early Childhood Programs, and Tammy Williams, Education Specialist for Early Childhood Programs. Anna? Hi, everyone. First of all, I want to say thank you um, for just really taking the time with us today to have this conversation. It's an honor. We really see this work as the lens through which we do our work. So spending this time with you is um, just a, it's a treat to see people coming from all over the country who care about this work in this conversation. So folks from like Kentucky to Oregon, I saw everyone saying hi and just amazed um, where everyone is coming from. So thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because we have a lot to pack in one hour. Um, so I'm hoping that we stay focused in the beginning. Um, we're gonna do some talking in the beginning before then we really open it up to the, the questions because we really wanna be um, honoring where you are and where you wanna focus our time together today. But we wanted to get some baseline um, things down. So let me go ahead and just hold, uh, just bear with me while I um, share a screen. There we go. Oh my gosh. I'm actually having a little trouble with this. Uh-oh. There we go. Sorry. Technology, am I right? This uh, okay. it happens to the best of us. <laughs> it's just every, every uh, platform is slightly different. So again, thanks for bearing with me. Um, Let's go to slide slow and start from the beginning. All right, so we are here to really talk about um, talking about race with children and um, Arielle, Tammy and I work on the early childhood education team at the um, Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we, um, like I said, we have a lot to pack in today. We are really, hoping that at least the two things you take from this, the two big goals, are that um, we are here to advocate for young children, young children in museums, and to also get the message out that the work of being anti-racist and being anti-biased is work for all of us. It's not a program or a curriculum to, um, to do, to check off, but it's, again, the lens through which we view every interaction, every program we plan, um, and we're hoping by the end of this time together that you'll have some concrete ideas for what you can do even in your museum because, again, it's the work of everyone. And so whether you're um, very focused on young children, whether you're in a cultural museum or not, it's the work of all of us to, first of all, be anti-racist and anti-bias. There's my cat, always making an appearance. And also to um, be thinking about how um, we are really creating a culture for, for every child. So, and we all have a role in that, whether we directly have children in our lives or not. And so this cat wants to be famous. Um, I don't know if any of you are all familiar with community agreements. It's something we do in all of our workshops and I'm offering them to us all today. 
um, because it helps really when we're having conversations about our identities and um, around race. And these come from courageous conversations about race and we're, we borrow them from Glenn Singleton. Um, and I'm gonna really ask you to lean into the last one in the sense of accepting and expecting non-closure because again, this is um, a big conversation that <laughs> is um, only an hour long. Uh, the other community agreements are stay engaged. So sometimes as we're talking about race and our identities, there can be um, discomfort. And I just ask you, even if, if things are pushing in your mind to continue to stay engaged and stay with us. Um, if you have something to say into the chat box and want to share an experience, again, just please speak from your truth and from your lived experience, rather trying to speak from um, for another group. And then um, experience dis um, ex uh, oh, experience discomfort. Sorry, I text <laughs> wrote that little um, quickly. Um, so experiencing that discomfort can again happen when we are talking about how our identities are formed because it's, inc it's incredibly complex work and everyone's journey is different and all of our social identities come together um, to bring us to this point. And so that's one thing I just really wanna set from the top of our conversation is that this is one moment in time and one step in each of our journeys and that um, it is ongoing work that I hope you continue to take with you. So many of you may be familiar with the recent launch of our Talking About Race web portal and um, hopefully you've had a chance to get into some of the content. And if you are not, then let me introduce it to you. This is a web portal that we um, shared with the public a few weeks ago, about three weeks ago. And um, it is actually based on work we've been doing for the last decade at the museum. So it was put out in a moment of um, several racial incidents that have happened, um, violence against black bodies. And that, if you know anything about the history of race in this country, should know that it's what's happening is not a surprise and it's not new. Although for many, there's shock and upset. And what I hope for those of you who are awakening to this moment and to this history, that you are in this work for the long haul. Um, and it felt that it was the right time for us as a museum to release this web portal, but again, it is the work that we've been doing and it's the foundation through which all of our programs are created. And so my partner that you see in some of the photos is the head of teaching and learning, Kendra Flanagan. And we both came at this work from our different perspectives, both of our different social identities, me as a white woman and her as a black woman, and our different roles within the education department. Um, as the early childhood education specialist, uh, I, which was my role is when we first started, was just really thinking about our, part of our museum's mission was to be a place of healing and reconciliation. And if you pause and think, what does that mean for young children when they're not at a place that they need the healing and the reconciliation that comes later in life? What do we need to create that foundation for young children to dismantle racism, to live in a world where there isn't racism? So what we're doing is reimagining the world and the fact that we've never lived in a society, we've never lived in a time when there isn't racism. It's embedded in our country and in its history. And we're, we're, we're hoping to change that. So it's the ongoing work. And it was really based on workshops that we did for educators and families over the last seven years. And so the portal itself was taking all of the work we did together with other people in these different cohorts, in these different workshops, and then take it and try to scale it on a national um, in a national way and on the web, which for any of you all who are educators with us today, you know that the work of being person to person versus being online is very different. So we did a lot of mental gymnastics to make that shift, that change to the portal. Um, but today we're actually not really diving into the portal. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it before we get into the, the, the early childhood piece. But just a few things. The topics of both the in-person uh, in workshops and the portal are really looking at how to be anti-racist. What bias do we have? Because all of us have bias and it's not something that uh, we necessarily need to feel bad about. It's something we need to interrogate every day and think about why we might have a bias and then think about what is it, where is it coming from and what needs to change about it. Um, but it's part of being human. 
it's then when those biases then lead to action and can hurt groups of people. Central to our work at the museum are two things that um, are community building and self-care. So there's the community piece. We have to be in community with each other. And the self-care piece is that that's part of the radical work of dismantling racism and that we have to commit to not burning out. And so that self-care piece is, is really critical. So the end of our programs always have that. And I think it looks very differently depending if you're white versus person of color versus black because there are different, um, that there's just different lived realities. And so we wanna be cognizant of that as well. Again, we also talk about systemic oppression and the different systems that come together, how our different social identities overlap um, and what that means. And then how race is, we live in a racialized society. That means we each have a race. And with that race comes power. And so the color of your skin either has privilege, opportunity with it, or oppression. And with that, we um, are really thinking again how that develops over time. So this there's, there's a lot of complexity to this work, if you can't already tell, um, or you don't already know from your own work, um, but it is a lot of things happening simultaneously. So we're individually doing our own reflection and asking educators, family members, adults to be reflecting on their own individual journey, but also the work of, of collective and looking the collective work as well as looking at systems and that um, within systems, there's embedded again, that privilege or oppression. And then finally, we really are considering the arc of a person's life and how race, uh, race and identity develops over time. And we start with infants. And so I think in my work in early childhood, one of the biggest questions I always get is what does that look like? How is that possible? And what do young children even know? Are we going to be teaching children to be prejudiced if we talk about race? What does all this mean? So that's really where our time together is gonna to go. And that's the work that Ariel, Tammy and I and the rest of our team do every day in thinking about young children and how they understand themselves and others. So a few things I'm gonna run through and I, ha I, do, I did include um, some citations because I think it's important to understand also that this is not just something that we think, but something that we know um, through, through many studies over time. So starting with infants recognize race, starting at six months, and because that, that is um, consistent at that age, there actually means that it's happening earlier. So it's really between three and six months that children are being able to distinguish and categorize other people by race. So children then starting as young as two use those different categories to make re to reason about other people's behavior and make decisions. And so when I talk to, to grownups and thinking about why we do this work with young children, it's because it's, we are truly honoring who children are as learners when we do talk about race, when we acknowledge that, that con construct within, within our country, within our lived experience. Um, and then as children grow, they are categorizing, they are expressing bias, they are making choices um, with playmates and how they interact with other people based on race. I think one of the things that um, we wanna share today is really like the silence of not talking about race actually is more damaging and speaks volumes to um, what that means within our society and culture. Um, and so when we're not talking, children are left to make the, try to fit those pieces of the cognitive pu puzzle and put it together and figure out what all of these things mean. And so another interesting study I found is that children don't always have the same opinions on race as their parents, even in the early years or, it, or the parents or the caregivers in their home. And that's because there's a lot of um, meta messages around in the culture that show children who in, has opportunity, what is privilege, that behavior is much more impactful sometimes than just the conversation. So it's a lot of things, again, happening at the same time that we need to be thinking about. So museums are a place that really are powerful places that tell stories, right? We, um, I, another interesting, study as far as museums go that some of you might be familiar with is that people actually listen to and believe more what a label in a museum says 
than if someone they went to a museum with um, disagreed or had a contrasting opinion, um, even in their lived experience. So they might read something and someone say, that's not what I've experienced in my life. Well, the, the most people believe museums more. So we have a lot of power in uh, the stories we tell, what we uplift. And I think we can all recognize that it's been predominantly the story of the white male. And so what we have the opportunity to do with our work in museums is really to then share different stories and different perspectives. And so with young children, it's incredibly important for them to be able to see stories that reflect them, that see stories that are different from them and begin to see that whole complexity and fullness of our culture and different people. So we have, these are all the things, just I try to do that as quickly as possible, um, are all the things we think about as we create our programs. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Ariel and Tammy, and Ariel's gonna start and talk about um, some specific examples, how we activate our collections, and then some of those next steps you can do within your own work. So Ariel, there you go. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to say that, um, or echo a little bit of what Anna said, is that this is a huge topic. Um, and so today, we're going to try and give you some takeaways that, that are, uh, that you can take action on, um, you know, sooner than later. But this is work that just takes a very long time, and it's not going to end. And so today, we are going to give you just a little bit of something that we hope um, you can take and use um, for the benefit of your visitors and yourself. Um, our first recommendation when it comes to engaging with children um, in the museum as a whole and then in relation to talking about race is, you know, in order to begin making our collections accessible to and engaging for children and later for having conversations around identity and similar topics, um, it's essential that we start looking at our collections in new ways. Um, museums are such strong learning environments for children because of the object-based learning that uniquely happens in museums. And so connecting stories to objects is really a natural learning style for young children for us to take advantage of. Um, to start looking at your museum's objects in a new way, um, you have to be open to using objects for different reasons than the exhibit's uh, intended objective. Um, oftentimes our exhibits are designed with adult audiences in mind um, and are focused on topics and histories that aren't engaging for children um, or designed in a developmentally appropriate uh, way for them. Um, however, if we look at these same exhibits without the consideration of the exhibit's original intention or objective, and more so through the eyes of a child, there will be so many new possibilities for making the museum inviting to young audiences, as well as um, our exhibits can begin to be gateways into talking about larger topics and deeper topics. Um, so now, you know, the car that is meant to tell the history of the American auto industry uh, can be used to discuss shapes and sounds or um, the many ways we travel with our families, where we like to go or where we come from, um, or an exhibit that is focused on, you know, minerals or gemstones can become a space for talking about colors, but also talking about the importance of the land we stand on and the stories of Native folks. Um, when we make our museum, our whole museum and the objects within it accessible for all people, um, including children, regardless of age, we're really doing anti-bias and anti-racist work. Um, and that's where it's really important to get started with that new perspective. Um, when we see our collections in new ways, we can begin using the objects then to spark conversations around race, identity, human diversity, justice, advocacy, the whole spectrum of things that are really important. Um, we can introduce or talk about abstract ideas like race through the concrete and tangibleness of objects. Um, 
a few of the ways that we've done that with our collections, um, the ways we've tried to look at our collections in the museum through a child's perspective um, in our programming, particularly with our infants and toddlers. Um, I'll give some examples, um, is we've used the portraits in our art gallery to talk about facial differences um, and skin color. Um, we've used, we took the costumes from the Wiz that were put in an exhibit to talk about Black Broadway, um, and instead we're using them, um, using the characters to discuss friendship and bravery. Um, or talking about the textures of paintings and clothing items to begin conversations around hair textures and consent for touching people's hair. Um, so we've, we've tried to take our collection and ultimately make it accessible by looking at it from a, diff a different child's, a child's lens. Um, Tammy. Um, so I kind of come in with this programming, um, trying to figure out how to create activities that go with these gallery exhibits that usually Ariel will do the gallery exhibit, exhibit and I will come and do the actual um, stations where, where children can actually explore that idea of what they got from the museum and the gallery into a place where they can actually discover and touch and create and build. So for instance, when we did our programming on hair, um, my main thing was like, all right, we, I want to have a space where they can explore and touch different textures. Um, because, you know, children will want to, they see different texture, they're going to want to touch it, but we don't want our children going around just touching people's hair. I mean, even as adults, you don't want to do that. So we give them the experience of touching things. So we made sensory bags, sensory gloves. We had a sensory collage they could create. We even had a sensory walk where we would put down different items on the floor and have kids walk on these items and feel them with their feet and their hands. Um, and the kids would make a take, the children would make a takeaway and they would actually take pieces of like cotton they would take pieces of sandpaper and different type of textured items and make their own art collage with it. Um, then we did for families, I thought of, you know, how do I, because not every child has the same family, so you have, to, you have to respect kind of where these children are coming from, not everyone has the same experiences. So for families, we, I, you know, I thought of um, using nesting dolls, peg dolls, and having like a center for like baby care, but to make sure that we had different dolls of different varying skin, varying skin tones. And then we also had discussion questions at every station. And it, would, it was used to spark conversations between the adults and caregivers at those stations. But it was also used to, um, for caregivers to talk to their children about these questions. So some would be, for, for instance, we had, um, when we talked about families, one of our questions was, how do you define home? And for people that, for different people, it'd be, it would mean different things, but it would help just to start a conversation amongst the families in, this, in the centers to kind of further develop their own language and their own understanding of what a home means for them. Thanks, Tammy. Um, so we wanted to give you all um, just a few specific next steps that you can take today or beyond um, and beyond in your work um, that we have tried to do um, in our programming um, and at this museum as well as in, in some of my past work. Um, the first thing is that it's, um, we need to name identities and show pictures of the people that you teach about. Um, oftentimes it may feel more comfortable to just mention people by name without uh, mentioning their racial identity. However, when we acknowledge the identities of the people we are telling stories about, we respect who they are. And it is so valuable to describe what you see and know versus trying to be colorblind. Um, as Anna mentioned earlier, they are seeing it and they want to know about it and talk about it. Um, but we, in us avoiding saying those things out loud or shushing comments about some, that they noticed about someone's skin or their body, um, we, that topic begins to be seen as taboo. And as a result, we avoid it, they'll avoid it, at least in our presence, and they'll develop their own understanding of it without your involvement because you're not talking about it. Um, when we are referring to a group of people or referencing their work, 
um, or creations, you can show pictures of who they are. Um, it's really crucial that children know that all kinds of people have contributed to the arts, sciences, history, um, the world. Um, and by including their photos, we help to like em emphasize this truth um, without naming their identities or giving names to the faces um, of the people we're telling stories about. We're, we end up participating in a form of erasure um, of those people. Um, my second recommendation for you all today is that if you don't have any or you have very few objects in your exhibits dedicated to telling the stories of Black, Indigenous, or people of color, um, add your own. Just because a story isn't featured in a case, um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, our, our museums, as um, Anna mentioned, like have so much power and what we tell, what we say is the story is what people kind of take as the story. Um, so at any, but we, what we know is that at any moment in history, people all over the world were living, doing, creating, and making history. Um, so in everything you design or you do, ask yourself, uh, who is missing? Um, and where, where were they? Where are they? And how can I bring them here? Um, Pre-existing objects like in your exhibits can maybe serve as the starting point for conversations, but they don't have to be where the story ends. Um, and we have the power to provide children with fuller stories by using photos of our objects, places, people, um, and to include the folks who are regularly left out of museum spaces. Um, the additional benefit of bringing in your own handheld or touchable object or photo um, is that adding hands-on and tactile elements into exhibit visits or programs make learning experiences more meaningful and engaging for children. Um, something that they're able to see even closer than the glass will let them or touch and hold um, it, it has a different kind of impact in their like brain and developmental understanding of a topic as well as like in their hearts and minds. Um, and it, we, our hope is that the stories that we tell in the museum will go from being in the exhibit or behind the glass and really stick with children and um, be something that they can take home and into the world as they grow um, into adulthood. Um, yeah, that's, that, that, those are my first two tips. Tammy has um, another really um, strong recommendation for what else we can do. I think my, um, I'm gonna use this basically as a reminder for a lot of educators that, um, that talking about race is not easy. I mean, it's, it takes practice. It, it's something that's always ongoing. I mean, I'm still learning about things but know that you can talk about identity and serious topics in an honest, child-appropriate way, and you don't have to do it alone. Um, it's not an easy task, and it's probably a good start maybe to talk to family, to your team, to your fellow educators about, you know, how you're feeling about this topic, because, I mean, it, it needs to be discussed not just with children, but with yourself as well, and making sure you do it in a holistic way. Um, making sure, just like you do with your audience, making sure you're looking at them as holistic individuals. I mean, as a whole, there's, there's your emotions part, there's their, your physical part, and all those things play a role in how you see race, how you discuss race. Um, but, you know, be patient with yourself. I mean, it, it takes practice. And um, just remember that you are not responsible nor capable of building a child's entire understanding of race though you can play a really important role in educating them and supporting them to develop a positive sense of self and joy and human diversity. I think that's our main goal is that we want to make sure that our audience, our children, our younger children to our older children understand that there's joy and human diversity. And within museums, there's so many ways you can do that. And you know, don't forget that you don't talk to, we don't talk to children alone. There's always going to be an adult or a caregiver, an educator, a teacher that's going to be there when they enter our space. So it's important that we give um, these adults something to take away, maybe some kind of um, information where they can extend the conversation at home, because it may start with you 
as their first topic or first conversation, but we don't want it to end with you. I mean, there's no way that they, we can, we want this to end in a museum. This needs to be done at home, done with their, their friends and their schools. So making sure you're giving your audience something they can take with them. So maybe they can kind of continue this conversation in other areas of their life. Yeah. I think the, the genius of what Ariel and Tammy do in their programs within the museum is that they are simultaneously teach, like engaging children as well as the adults. And so it's, um, it's modeling for the adults how to, to, to talk to children about these topics and um, encouraging those adults to also be thinking about their own identities there while then being completely age appropriate and uh, um, engaging with children. So I, I hope you heard as Ariel and Tammy were talking just like how thoughtful they are about the connections they make to where children are developmentally not just where they are with what I described in the beginning with how children's racialized identity forms over time, but how children learn. And I think that's one place that the like, museums are so powerful for learning for many reasons, but with young children, there are so many opportunities to, to engage them. And, um, you know, there might be that question of like, how do we ha have these like very abstract conversations about race identity with young children? And you know, the museum objects, that concrete objects that as Ariel was um, describing, are just like those powerful jumping off points that we can start, again, honoring who children are as learners to get to the, the abstract ideas. And I think we just, we are such advocates for children. We believe in children and respect who they are and that they can have these conversations, but it is about layering the conversations. So we are firmly grounded in anti-bias education for young children and ourselves and the work um, that's come from Enid Lee and Julie Olson Edwards and um, many others who have gone before us. And in those principles, there's four things that come up. There is identity, diversity, um, justice, and activism. And none of them stand alone. They all work in tandem at the same time. But we start with young children with building that concept and that sense of self and encouraging them to see how we are the same and how we are different. And that, um, I think that is somewhere, it was in, I had an interesting conversation earlier this week about how um, the conversation, the, the, the idea of identity and that positive sense of self we want to do with black and brown children because we see that that's not, you know, that's not the reality of our culture but then we don't talk about the diversity with them. And then we might not be talking about that positive racialized identity with white children, but we're trying to become diversity. And so it's really though, it needs to be happening with all children and just being very thoughtful that it's never about being better than or less than. Um, and then with that, helping children in the language they understand of fairness and unfairness and for any of us who've worked with three, four and five year olds, we certainly know that they are, are quick to point out what is fair, what isn't fair. And by activating the language that they use and they know, we can begin to get that, um, the racial injustice that is um, part of this culture. And then uh, empowering children to see themselves as um, agents of change and that they have um, the potential to also, you know, make choices to have change and make a difference. Um, and then we lay, layer in some of those systems and the bigger, the issues of systemic oppression, but it's always ongoing. We're all learning every day. It's a practice. And, um, but I think as you begin to shift your mindset and, and use this lens, you can see how every, every word choice you make, every object you choose to share, how you activate the space um, really is getting back to that notion of, of being anti-racist or not, being anti-biased or not. And so, that's just where we encourage you all to go. So we wanted to leave time, plenty of time for questions. So um, Tricia, did you have some coming in? Yeah, no, we've got lots of great questions and comments coming in. So thanks everybody, keep them coming. Um, just a couple of questions um, going back to the programs Ariel and Tammy were talking about. Um, are these activities and programs designed to be a standalone event or are they offered regularly? Um, how are they structured? 
Um, okay, so prior to us having the museum closed, um, I'll just act as if we're still in that reality. Um, these are two, we are talking about um, two program series. Um, today, our examples were focused on um, our program called Cultural Cuddles, uh, which is for zero to 12 month olds and the um, adults that come with them. Um, and then Toddling Treasures, which is our program for 13 to 35 month olds, which is basically one, two and three year olds um, and the adults that come with them. Um, these are these were weekly programs. Um, and so they happen once a week um, and the whole month is one theme. And so um, some of our themes for a month would be something like skin, um, skin color, faces, bodies, um, textures, music, what else have we done? You've done we've we've done so many different ones, um, but it's been it's been almost a year actually of this, um, and so we've learned a lot from the beginning um, of what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I actually um, have to say that when I was doing the research for how to design the programs, I actually called other museum educators, like in other states, um, and talked to them about like how do you do this. Um, and I always really love that about museum education is that folks are willing to give some advice. Um, but the structure of it is we'll start off in the beginning um, with introduce, well, by learning about everyone's names and saying hello to everyone. We really um, think learning someone's name is important. Um, and then we move into a little like five minute conversation about why the theme is skin today. Um, and so we talk about um, developmentally what's going on with their child and then like what um, what we're going to do now in the museum to support their child's growth in um, in their own self identity or um, practicing uh anti-racism with with other friends in the future um, then we go into the exhibits for about 10 minutes and during that time i'll have introduced the activity of what we're going to look at that day and do and the families then are able to for about 10 minutes go and have those interactions personal interactions between their child whether it's a toddler or infant um, and the art piece. Some of the pictures you saw in Anna's um, presentation were um, of children with um, handheld mirrors. And so our goal that in that program um, for looking at faces or skin color is to do a little bit of compare and contrast and have your child look at themselves, look at your face, look at these faces in the portraits. Um, and then after about that 10 minutes, we go into the stations and that's where a lot of the conversations and the deeper diving into things happen because as the children are engaging in the um, activities that Tammy has designed, um, they're also having conversations and we've been working on introducing discussion questions, um, signage, but then also checking in at different stations and, and asking parents um, and caregivers different things. And that's where we've gotten a chance to really dive deeper into specific conversations about race and identity um, in that casual setting of being of playing and building and happen to be also talking about race and identity. Yeah, I think that's what's really struck me is hearing you talk about your programs is that you're not doing like, let's talk about race or, you know, it's yeah. you're, you're finding these or seemingly organic, although I know they've taken a lot of effort and time to plan thoughtfully, but you're doing it in a way that it, it seems like parents are ready to receive uh, and th that are, of course, developmentally appropriate for the children as well. And so mm -hmm. I think that's something that is a big takeaway for me in, in this. Um, in the, those programs that you're describing, Ariel, about how many participants do you usually have? Um, we limit it to 20 children. Um, and um, caregivers are allowed to, to join them. Our museum specifically has um, uh, tickets still, um, ticketing going on. So like that um, actually, I think it helped us in some ways, but it, as you might imagine, it also um, makes it a little more difficult for other programs. But for these, we wanted them to be very intimate um, mm -hmm. and smaller um, because of the age of the children, but also because of the content. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've gone between 15 and 20 um, infants or toddlers. 
at our some of our other like story times or family day programs those are are much larger um and the content still addresses the four goals um of anti-bias education but in a um in a bigger um way and a way that is um is is a little bit more appropriate for a wider age range as well mm -hmm. we kind you. of look at the different because we range from these smaller programs to programs that have over a thousand people at them so yeah. that through like uh, the lens of like depth versus breadth and we need to be doing both and so there's the real deep dive with the programs we're sharing today but as Ariel just said, that lens is still even in the programs and that thought and care go into the programs that we have where we have over a thousand people. And if you had to pick, what would you recommend? Do you start, do you start with that intimate, in-depth experience or do you think, I mean, if a museum is just getting into this or do you think you take an opportunity with a big crowd and maybe test a lot of different things or, or is either a valid approach? Um, you know, I think either is a valid approach. I, I've been with the museum um, like almost a decade and we opened in 2016, but I was piloting programs around the community this whole time. As you all, most of you all know our founding director, Lonnie G. Bunch and his vision and like just his amazing way of thinking. And he, he said to us, he wanted us to be a museum that was basically open without a building. And so we were actively doing programs, exhibitions before the wall, like the doors even opened. And so um, some of the earliest iterations of cultural cuddles and toddling treasures were being piloted back in 2014. And so I do absolutely encourage that as an approach, piloting, testing. We do a lot with liberatory design and thinking about um, that as a pass, doing empathy interviews, Ariel described how she engaged the museum community to talk to, that um, we, we see this work as, as community work and that we're learning from others too. And, and as you test, you, you can find out what works. I think also we all have live within the reality of what our museum um, is capable of, like what we have space for, you know, we all, there's so many different parameters. It's just knowing what, what you can do within your space. Yeah, I think it's also, um, Trisha, as you said, like, um, it does not have to be a program that is like race day or <laughs> diversity friends. Like it, it can, it, what you're doing now, like if you can try, like you can add it into what you're doing unless what you're doing is completely racist or not okay, which I assume is not what's happening. But like, basically like it, it can be, if let's say you have those like family days, like maybe you pilot with like a station that is about um, self portraits and, and talking about how I look and what I love about myself and taking like those conversations, you'll learn so much like from visitors and, and from the kids about what they wonder or like what they notice. Mm -hmm. And then using that, um, we did a lot of like little pop-up activity stations before this to see what how deep you can get what things they are wondering so that when we are starting to do stuff it's a little bit based on if, now that we're doing that more intimate some of the more intimate programs it's based on real like interactions we had before we got to this one-on-one -on -one, let's talk about race kind of environment yeah i think that's so so such great advice that you don't have to you know, eat the elephant all in one bite, you know, you can take a little bite and see how it goes. Um, and that you can think about, um, think about incremental implementation um, and figuring out how to make it work with what you're already doing. Hmm. I think yeah, say you probably want to, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Anna. No, go, Tammy. <laughs> you probably want to stay away from those multicultural events. I think it's because, um, if you want to stick to an actual theme, like Ariel was saying, skin, or like those ways, those are ways you can relate to everyone in your audience instead of putting on a show saying, you know, we're going to celebrate everyone, but what does that mean when it doesn't, it doesn't involve everyone? It's kind of putting on a show, people of color are putting on this show for people who aren't of color. So it's, it's a matter of trying to stay away from that whole multicultural idea and looking at something more specific. Great. Um, 
So there's a couple of questions about, um, well, you've touched on this a little bit, but one question about, could you give kind of a role play example of a conversation you've had or might have with maybe a parent and caregiver, Ariel, you were saying a lot of times the most rich conversations come when you're doing those more casual check-ins, like how does that go? How might you approach a parent and what might a conversation look like, a parent and a child? What might that interaction look like? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I miss having the, the interactions as they, they would be weekly fresh content to share with you all. Um, I think, let me think, one of the more recent things that I'm remembering, it happened at our infant program um, and we were talking, but I'll give a, an older friend example um, to uh, at our, one of our infant programs we were talking, it was actually about skin color. Um, and I was sitting with some parents, a um, few parents, and um, to me their racial identity uh, was white women. Um, and they, we were talking about how like um, not everyone in a family may look the same. And particularly like for myself as being a biracial woman, like my parents don't look exactly like me. They're two different kinds of parents. Uh, uh, racial identities and um, and just talking about how skin colors can be different in a single family and one of the women she was saying oh um, she actually was reading this book about um, white and Asian biracial identity because her husband um, was Filipino and oftentimes when he, uh, he'd be carrying their son people ask a lot of questions um, because this guy, uh, the their skin colors are different um, and at the same time, this um, woman that was next to me, um, she was um, actually white and from England. Um, she's married to um, a Chinese man and they're, she has had, they, they started sharing a story. They didn't know like from even looking at their babies and sitting right next to each other, but until that conversation came up, they then started talking about their connection between what it's like for the, the Asian families and the white families to come together and like what what that experience is like. And I and I actually, you know, kind of was like, okay, I'm gonna let you all do that and, and move on. Um, but that's the kind of thing that could come up. When we've had like older friends, um, some of the conversations that I've had has been around um, like skin color. Sometimes um, we try to make sure we're providing a lot of different colors of the paper and the coloring materials. And so, um, we, and, and something that I've talked to parents about and we've tried to practice is like, how do you describe the different colors of skin? And so some of those kinds of conversations have happened where I'm talking to a child and they might say, like, I have brown skin, um, and they want a certain piece of paper. Um, the skin color of the paper doesn't appear to me to look the same. Sometimes like friends with darker skin, um, are choosing lighter paper um, and trying to have a conversation with that friend um, about um, why they think that's the same or why they are choosing something different. Um, and then maybe using some of our books that we have. Books are a great tool for having the conversations, um, like our book um, Shades of Black that show that um, black children can be a lot of different shades of brown and it doesn't have to um, be a lighter shade even if that's what our society is sometimes um, encouraging and saying is the the right way or the best way to be um, that's those are just a couple little examples that's great um, and then we've got some questions about um, some tougher situations um, you know how do you address address a racist comment um, particularly made by a child, like that's something maybe comes up in a program or a tour. How do you handle something like that? Or how would you suggest handling something like that? I think for, um, there's a lot of different people probably in that scenario. So there's the parent of the child who said it, potentially the parent of the child who said it to, and then us there as the museum educator. So there's a lot of like, Right, a lot of people, a lot of feelings. Um, the parent of the person who's, whose child said the comment might feel really embarrassed and try to like hush up the child. Um, and I think for us, what we wanna do is we don't want to shame that child. 
for what they've said, but what we want to point out is that it's hurtful language. And so being very honest, open, again, age appropriate without shaming, one approach can be um, inquiry. Hopefully we're all, you know, all behind that, it's like asking the child to explain more why they said what they've said so we can actually get a little more understanding and context from the child. Also checking in with the child who's been said to to see where they are with their feelings. And then also saying at our museum, we, you know, like we put our values into it here. We don't accept those words. Those are unkind and those are hurtful. And so having that also as a framework to help guide the conversation is important. Tammy and Ariel, would you add more? Yeah, um, I want to ask folks to um, think about whether the comment is racist or if it's mm -hmm. an observation of what mm -hmm. the child is seeing. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the things that we um, think that they're saying because of our like adult knowledge, we might hear that as being a mean thing to say about someone. They might be seeing it as um, literally just a fact that they thought was real or like an observation that they're making. So mm -hmm. someone saying, pointing out what someone's skin color is, um, maybe they might use a word that you don't really want it to be compared to, mm -hmm. but let's say they say this person, um, you know, is brown or that I see a black person or um, that person's skin looks dirty. This is not necessarily them trying to be mean to that person or mm -hmm. like other that person. Developmentally, this is just what they see and what they say when they see it. So mm -hmm. listening to it through the lens of like, you can ask that follow-up question, but like, what did they, what are they really saying? Mm -hmm. um, and acknowledging it for what it was. It's like, oh, I noticed, are, are you saying that because that person's skin is brown? You're right that their skin is brown, but it's not dirty. Some mm -hmm. people have darker brown skin, some people have lighter brown skin, um, but it's not something that you can clean off. That's just the, that's the way our skin is. Like what, a, like a, it doesn't have to be a big um, lecture yeah. either in that moment. And totally. so sometimes I've seen that like a lot of people get uncomfortable when, you know, their child points out someone's body in the, mm. in the metro or someone's yeah. this or that, or they make an out loud comment about another person. Mm -hmm. um, and it is uncomfortable because we've been taught not to act like we notice those things. Mm -hmm. um, but the moment we say, like our response to that is just so, it's gonna have so much power on how that yeah. child thinks about voicing their observations in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I always would just, I always am like, hold on, let me listen to this again. <laughs> what were they really trying to say? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times they also are just repeating something that they heard someone else say mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily their families. It could be somewhere else that they are hearing this. Um, so they may not fully also understand what they're saying and why they're saying it. They might just be replicating a value or a statement that was said by someone that they think they should copy some something of. And use it as a, a learning experience. Um, yeah. So you may have um, a, play, a time where a child may say something that could be offensive to someone, but make sure like you keep that in mind next time you have a group of children and maybe even bring that up or bring up a topic to kind of stop those kind of comments before it even gets there. Um, so if it's about, you know, a child saying that someone is dirty, um, maybe making it about explaining how skin color works, how people get skin color before you even you know, go further with that exhibit or with that, with that moment. Hmm. Much to consider in the moment of like the age of the child. Yeah. Like all, all these different things that Tammy and Ariel are, are pointing out. And I think Ariel made such an important point of like, we don't ever want to lecture children because first of all, that's age appropriate. And we're then also yeah. talking to them like they're adults. Thank you. That's great advice. Um, and then there's a question from Abby about, um, you know, you've talked so much about integrating this race and anti-racism into everything. Um, and she says, you know, unfortunately some families with children may not want their children to be involved in these topics because of their own misguided beliefs. So, 
do you ever worry about that? Is there ever a case for, for doing the diversity day or something if you're, particularly if you're in your community that maybe is, this is new um, and you're charting some, you're, you're in uncharted territory maybe? And I don't know if that's the case with Abby. I'm just sort of giving that as an example. I, yeah, I, I think there's a couple things, um, just big picture, and then I want to turn it back over to Ariel and Tammy, um, but to consider, and again, that this is a lens. So really, it's, it's really about the language we use, even if we're talking about trains, like they're, we, they're, we're still thinking in an anti-bias, anti-racist lens of how we engage other people. So to Abby's question of like, yes, it, it is in everything we do. In every every planning, the choice of objects, the choice of stories, the language we use, how we treat people, how we in, design our programs, it is it is the lens through which we do everything. And then, as far as like the explicit programming, you hear very much from Ariel and Tammy what our programs look like. But when we the explicit programs that are like let's talk about race are the programs we do with adults because that's. Again, we're doing a lot of work simultaneous and for all of those of us who are working in museums, all of those who, of us who are parents, you know, who are educators, we have our racialized identity, we have all of our social identity, our, my nearly 40 years of lived experiences bringing me to this point. And what I do every day is I interrogate what my lived experience has been and what biases I have. So I think as a museum staff, as museum professionals, we need to continually be doing that work of interrogating ourselves and how bias shows up potentially in our work. And that's where the portal that I shared in the beginning is a great place to go to, to begin to do some of that work. But then I'll turn it over to Ariel and Tammy to talk specifically about the program for children. Yeah, I think that um, if we avoid the things that are gonna make some people uncomfortable, you're just gonna keep doing the exact same thing you've already been doing. Um, this work isn't gonna, it's not gonna be a uh, pleasing content for everybody, but if you already have visitors who maybe they think that you're a great place, they already like visiting, that can give some weight to a topic like talking about skin color or body positivity or hair, like um, even if it's embedded in other ways, because like they're like, okay, if this place cares about that, maybe you can use that privilege that you have like um, access to the ears that you have access to and say just a little bit of something in it, you know, and, and it, they're already listening um, and you, you get to take a, advantage of that moment. And if we wait till everyone is at the same comfort level, we're not ever going to be moving forward. And we get the chance to like normalize it. And when I talk about whatever I'm talking about, even in a story time that is about like music or a fun day, like at the park, it, it can be tiny comments that I'm making about someone's appearance in there, or it just, the, it's the images themselves that speak for um, us being anti-bias or anti-racist. But like, in that moment, like I can, it doesn't have to be so strong. It doesn't have to be that intimidating. Um, but I, I think that it's, it's something that we just have to, we know that it's going to be a risk. And the thing is, is that like, we want to like accept and love like everybody, but at the same time, like you have to have a, a tolerance of like a standard of what you're going to tolerate and what you're how much you're going to let your visitors impact like your decisions of doing what you believe is the right thing to do right um and we're almost at the end of our hour which i can hardly believe because i feel like we could talk about this for so much longer um and again thank you all so much i feel like i've learned an incredible amount this afternoon um, but Jennifer will wrap this up as a, with a final question. Actually, there's two final things. Um, one, I think, will be quick at the very end. Um, but Jennifer asks, um, she is in a historic house museum, and they talk to students about um, slavery um, with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And sometimes the groups are predominantly white with maybe only a few students who are black or people of color. And do you have strategies for navigating that situation of talking about a difficult history without um, alienating any of the students or um, 
try and you know helping the students try to understand race and and what that moment means i think that question is so huge that it's hard <laughs> to truly honor the depth and complexity of that question it's such an important one i think one thing to that is a just a quick response is one thing that we feel is that a child's introduction to race shouldn't be through trauma or through the story of slavery. And so that, um, that's just not the entrance. That's not where we enter the conversation. That's too traumatizing for children and particularly for black and brown children. And if it's a majority white group with just a few children of color, the children of color are the ones in that situation who are gonna end up hurt. So I think um, just really being mindful about how that story is told and how it's balanced um, with the stories of resiliency and centering humanity. And so in our, our museum, in our collection, in our Slavery and Freedom exhibition, um, that balance we strive for throughout the museum is, is, is being honest and open and telling the unvarnished truth of, of American history, but also lifting up that resiliency, that strength, the resistance, and really centering humans and humanity in that story. Ariel and Tammy, would you add anything else quickly? Yeah, I, I think that if you, oftentimes we just say, okay, black people were enslaved. There's no um, value or belief assigned to it. Um, and we leave it hanging there for children to then interpret themselves. And it's like, we can say, um, these folks like had a beautiful life, culture, everything, whatever in where they were, people stole that, right? Like we need to talk about them before that moment um, of where someone made a decision about their life. Um, but also like talking about, like, like Anna was saying, the positives, like what these were actual people who weren't just victims of this horrendous crime, which is a complete fact. They were also survivors. And like, we hardly hear the stories in which like at whatever sites, like there's, there's stories that have been hidden about the forms of resistance, you know? Um, and I think that like, if we're only without explaining and saying it was actually wrong because no human deserves to be this. And this is the reason why they have that skin color. Like there's not even ever an explanation as to why someone's skin was darker and someone's skin was lighter. Like without having that context first, then like I do feel like black and brown children are instantly, the first thing that is being mentioned to their white classmates is that they were worth being enslaved. There's, there's nothing that has added to their other worthiness of like being a human. And so like we have to give extra information that is that that shows the beauty and the wholeness of like people who then were also enslaved mm -hmm. thank you um so we're getting a lot of um comments about how great this has been and also that people are interested in a similar program about working with older children so we'll see what we can do there i think that's a great suggestion um and one quick thing before we go um someone had asked if you have any videos of your programs in action that we might be able to share with our colleagues? I a little think we think we our, do. maybe family yes. days. Yeah, family, family days. Family days. We have some photos. lots of photos. <laughs> wow, that's so weird. We've never seen. That's actually, yeah, that's that. a great question. That would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I that you have any. Go ahead and send us any links or anything like that, and we can make sure that people get that information along yeah. with the um, recording. Um, but I just want to say thank you again so much. This was so worthwhile, I think. Um, and I, I just really appreciate again your time and your expertise in helping us all think about these big issues. So thank you and thank you to everybody who joined us this afternoon. Look for the, re the recording soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.